It is my honor to introduce Paul Tiambe Zaleza at today's Fellows Colloquium here at the Du Bois Institute at the Hutchins Center. A distinguished scholar and educational leader, Dr. Zaleza currently serves as Associate Provost and the North Star Distinguished Professor at Case Western Reserve University. Immediately prior to assuming his positions at Case Western, he was Vice Chancellor and Professor of the Social Sciences and Humanities at the United States International University in Nairobi. He has held, in addition, the positions of Honorary Professor at the University of Cape Town since 2006 and at the Nelson Mandela University since 2019. Dr. Zaleza's scholarship crosses disciplines and encompasses African studies, human rights, and literary studies, as well as education and leadership. He is the president, he's the present editor-in-chief of the Oxford Bibliographies Online in African Studies. An award-winning author himself, he has written or edited nearly 30 books and published hundreds of articles, book chapters, essays, and reviews. His most recent book is Africa and the Disruptions of the 21st Century, and he is currently editing a volume of reflections by former vice chancellors of some of Africa's leading universities, and that is entitled The Chronicles of African University Leaders. He has served as a consultant for major organizations such as the Ford and MacArthur Foundations on initiatives to revitalize higher education in Africa. His work with the Carnegie Corporation of New York has led to the establishment in 2013 of the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program, which to date has sponsored more than 600 African-born academics in the US and Canada to work with universities in nine African countries. As one can well imagine, Dr. Zalaza has served on numerous educational, professional, and business boards globally he has raised tens of millions of dollars for institutional advancement and individual research, including in 2020 a grant of $63.2 million from the MasterCard Foundation for Student Scholarships at, at the United States International University. He is also the author of short story collections and an acclaimed novel, Smoldering Charcoal, that is being turned into a movie. Please welcome Dr. Zaleza. Uh, thanks, Krishna, for uh, that very kind introduction. And uh, thank you all for uh, attending, uh, both in person as well as those who might be attending uh, virtually. Uh, I'm going to do a couple of things. Uh, one is to uh, summarize uh, the book. I can't do it in one hour. Uh, so what I thought I would do is simply read introductions to each of the chapters. But before that, I, w I want to frame the book by uh, reading uh, from the first page of the acknowledgments. So here it goes. This book represents my latest research and reflections on higher education. It focuses on the state of African and American academies before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. What I see as their major challenges, the institutional deficiencies exposed and exacerbated by the pandemic, and the competing imperatives for restoration to the pre-pandemic past and reform or transformation based on the depth of the lessons learned. My fascination with intellectual history started when I, I, I entered university administration in 1994, which joined my other interests in creative writing and literary criticism, economic history, development studies, gender studies, cultural studies, diaspora studies, and human rights studies. My work in intellectual history has taken three tracks. First, the history of ideas that found expression in the sixth volume, New Dictionary of the History of Ideas, for which I served as one of the associate editors, and many essays and several books on African studies. The books include Manufacturing African Studies and Crisis, that critique the production of African, Africanist knowledges in the Eurocentric academy. Rethinking Africa's globalization, the intellectual challenges, uh, an interrogation of the prevailing constructs of globalization 
in the 1990s and early 2000s. And the two volume edited collection, The Study of Africa, which examined how Africa was studied in all the major humanities and social science disciplines and interdisciplinary fields and, dif in, and in different world regions over the course of the 20th century. Second, the history of knowledge, produce, uh, knowledge producing institutions, especially universities. Besides this, I've published an edited two volume collection, African Universities in the 21st Century, that, has, uh, that surveyed the history and conditions of the continent's higher education institutions at the turn of the new century, followed later by the transformation of global higher education, 1945 to 2015, which analyzed the major institutional, intellectual, and organizational changes in higher education on every continent during the 70-year 70, uh, 70 period after World War II. And third, uh, I have uh, become a very uh, increasingly interested, perhaps as a reflection of aging, uh, in autoethnographic reflections uh, on my lived experiences with higher education in six countries on three continents and more than a dozen universities. My writings on this include a long eight-part interview with Toin Falola, perhaps Africa, uh, Africa's most prolific historian, that covers my reflections on my experiences uh, you know, uh, since I went to university in 1972. Following my departure as vice chancellor at the United States International University of Africa, I wrote a series of 10 reflections on my reflections, uh, uh, my experiences rather, published monthly from January to October 2022 uh, in University World News. I plan to turn the interviews and the reflections into a social biography of my generation's intellectual experiences since the 1970s. This book focuses on, on the two primary locations in which I've spent the bulk of my professional academic life, the United States and Africa. For nearly 25 years, I've worked at several American universities, both public flagships and medium-sized private institutions, where I served in various administrative positions as center director, department chair, college dean, academic vice president, and current associate provost. So I, I have developed a keen interest and perhaps understanding of the complex dynamics of the American Academy. Ever since I left my homeland, Malawi, in 1977 uh, for graduate study in Britain and later Canada, I've maintained enduring personal, professional, intellectual, and institutional connections on the continent. I've periodically returned to work there, specifically uh, to Kenya, the country in which I did my doctoral dissertation. In the 1980s, I taught at Kenyatta University for five and a half years after I left my first job at the University of the West Indies following the completion of my doctorate in 1982. And then for six years, between 2016 and 2021, I was at USIU, as uh, Krishna noted, in Nairobi. For decades, I've participated in various national, regional, continental, uh, uh, and international university association and research networks. Chapter one, the struggles for African universities. Higher education in Africa, as elsewhere in the world, has always been firmly latched to the ox cut of the prevailing political economy. In most countries, higher education institutions were established after the independence. The colonial extractive economies did not need large numbers, uh, large numbers of educated labor, and the functionaries of the colonial state despised and feared the educated elite who led the nationalist movements. In the twilight years of colonial rule, a few regional universities were established, which were often tied to metropolitan institutions to whose epistemic authority they were subservient. In 1960, the putative year of African independence, uh, because 17 uh, uh, countries attained independence, there were only 71 universities across the continent, most of them in North Africa and South Africa. At independence, many countries did not even have a single university and boasted a, of a handful of people with college degrees. In the 1960s alone, uh, nearly 100 new universities were founded as the new states sought to overcome the debilitating legacies of colonial underdevelopment and expanding education at all levels, which was deemed imperative uh, for the Africanization or indigenization of the civil service, the generation of human capital, for social economic development and cultivation of the civic values for nation building. Thus, the growth of African higher education 
is a post-colonial phenomenon and achievement, whatever challenges the sector has faced. The Africanization agenda was soon largely achieved, but the levels of human capital development remained low. Hardly had higher education found its footing when structural adjustment programs, SAPs, were imposed with fundamentalist zeal by the international financial institutions with the connivance of the political class and aspiring bourgeoisie in African countries. SAPs devastated higher education because they were premised on neoliberalism and its gospel of economic liberalization encompassing reduction of government spending, austerity, privatization, and deregulation. At a conference of vice chancellors in 1986 in Harare, the World Bank stated uh, Africa did not need investors because the social rates of return were higher for primary than tertiary education, a tendentious argument that was later disproved in the economic literature. Thus, while hundreds of new universities continued to be established in the 1980s and 1990s, what many regard as Africa's lost decades, the honeymoon between the state and higher education was long forgotten as public funding declined and faculty and students became embroiled in struggles for the second independence for, uh, for democratization. African economies recovered from 2000. The, um, as African economies recovered from 2000, there was explosive expansion in the number of higher education institutions and student enrollments. But struggles for funding, relevance, quality, and decolonization continued. African universities faced a triple set of challenges. Institutionally, how to promote effective internal governance and productive external uh, engagements. Intellectually, how to decolonize the Eurocentric epistemic order and build a, a vibrant and relevant knowledge systems for transformation, and ideologically, how to support and sustain the multi-pronged project of African nationalism. Then at the turn of the 2020s, the COVID pandemic uh, struck, COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic struck. The continent's economies, healthcare systems, and uh, societies were brutally appended. The pandemic revealed and reinforced pre-existing conditions and deficits. At the same time, it offered a moment for serious reflection on the future of higher education among its stakeholders, about the production, consumption, and dissemination of scholarly knowledges. As elsewhere in the world, some African universities managed the crisis better than others, became more resilient, and seemed poised for productive change. These are the issues uh, discussed in this chapter. It is divided into three parts. First, it examines the progress and challenges facing African higher education before the COVID-19 pandemic and provides comprehensive data on the spectacular growth of higher education institutions and student enrollments, faculty-student ratios, and gender parity index since 2000 across the continent before zeroing in on 10 countries, Botswana, Egypt, Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, Mauritius, Nigeria, Senegal, South Africa, and Uganda for more detailed analysis. Internationalization is also discussed in terms of the continent's inbound and outbound international student flows. Second, the chapter focuses on the dynamics of knowledge production, which begins by interrogating the enduring struggles for epistemic decolonization, the fraught debates on the subject, and the complex engagements and entanglements between the intellectual libraries of Africa, Europe, and the Americas, followed by an extensive review of Africa's positioning in the global knowledge economy in terms of various research indicators from expenditures to publications to the state of acad the academic publishing industry, as well as the need to seriously engage the knowledge systems of Asia and the African diasporas. Third, the chapter looks at the impact of the pandemic on African uh, higher education, the technological capacities that existed and were developed to manage it, the obstacles and advances made in the adoption of e-learning, and the prevalence of digital inequalities among and within countries and institutions. It goes into considerable detail on the pandemic experiences, responses, interventions, and effects on the key stakeholders, especially students and faculty in Africa's three largest economies, Nigeria, South Africa, and Egypt. The pandemic raises important questions about the post-pandemic academy, a subject discussed fully in chapter five on the futures of education worldwide, including Africa and the United States. Chapter two, higher education and development. Contemporary African higher education 
institutions are products of multiple histories and traditions. But almost invariably, their missions, values, and purposes reflect the complex demands of African nationalism, a project that, in essence, embodies desires and visions of African development, regeneration, and renaissance, following the long centuries of the Atlantic slave trade, European colonialism, and neocolonialism. The explosive growth of higher education after independence, discussed in the previous chapter, was a testament to the massive investment in national resources and imaginations in education, in, educa in uh, education's potential transformative power. However, the higher education institutions have not always lived up to their expectations by the state, society, and their own constituencies. Their contributions to the development project and process remain compromised by challenges that are simultaneously internal and external, institutional and intellectual, paradigmatic and pedagogical, and political and practical. Policy makers and other custodians of Africa's financial and development architecture, assets, and aspirations face incredible demands to generate, manage, and balance the allocation of limited resources to meet pressing and competing needs. African states and societies are embroiled in the Herculean struggle to overcome the persistent structural deformities and deficits bequeathed by colonial underdevelopment and dependency, and a stubbornly an equal world system with its hierarchical and exploitative divisions of labor. The continent's developmental challenges in the early 2020s were exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine that broke out uh, in February 2022 and destabilized global flows of commodities and reinforced trends towards deglobalization as the hegemonic struggles between the United States and China escalated. The United Nations Economic Commission for Africa estimate, estimates that since the outbreak of the pandemic, the annual development financing gaps for Africa, caught to meet the sustainable development goals, has, incre uh, has increased by $1.7 trillion, end of quote. On education, it says, quote, why primary school enrollments in the continent have increased, the quality of education remains low. Africa has the lowest literacy rates, 65.6% .6 of people aged 15 and above, and the lowest proportion of teachers that meet minimum uh, training standards, 49.8% in 2017. The estimated annual financing needs to improve access to the quality of education in Africa amounted to 39 billion dollars, end of quote. African governments, the regional economic communities, intergovernmental agencies, and external development partners need to pay special attention to higher education as the engine that drives the entire educational system. And a key pillar of the complex and intertwined development ecosystem in an age of knowledge economies and societies. The centrality of higher education is greater than ever as the fourth industrial revolution accelerates. Universities cannot undertake their own transformation, let alone of their societies, by themselves because they are embedded in the social economic context of their domestic location, whatever their professed globalized identities, interests, and ambitions. They are immersed in the imperatives and ideologies, as well as um, uh, ideologies of development as enunciated by states, business, and civil society, both at home and abroad, as well as by international financial institutions and other agencies. This is the subject of this chapter. The need for massive investment by all stakeholders and the radical transformation of higher education for Africa's future to realize the lofty dreams of generations of African nationalists currently coalesced around various national and regional visions, the Africa Union's Agenda 2063 and the UN's Agenda 2030 comprised of 17 sustainable development goals. The chapter is divided into, two th uh, into three parts. The first part examines the nationalist project that incubated Africa's post-colonial universities by looking at the complex and expansive visions of independence imagined by the nationalist movements. The persistent legacies of colonialism and their multifaceted impact on African political economies. The ideas on educational decolonization by key political leaders such as Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana and Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, as well as some influential investor leaders and associations. And the changing development contexts and periodization of Africa's post-independence develop, uh, developmental history that structured 
the changes and periodic reforms in higher education. Second, the chapter surveys debates about the development role of the developmental role of the African University by interrogating the conundrum and drivers of growth and development in the scholarly literature and popular discourses. It also examines the continent's rapid population growth and how it can be harnessed as a demographic dividend. The theoretical, empirical, and ideological debates on the linkages between higher education and development are reviewed, as is Africa's positioning in the rapidly shifting global science, technology, and innovation landscape in which the dominance of Euro-America is eroding as Asia steams ahead and becomes the world leader. It is imperative for Africa to leverage the fourth industrial revolution to avoid marginalize the marginalization and gross exploitation it suffered during the previous three industrial revolutions structured by the Atlantic slave trade and slavery, which spawned industrialization in Euro-America that generated the global colonial impulses of the new imperialism that ravaged Africa and Asia. Third, the chapter explores the conditions that constrain and facilitate inter institutional success uh, for African higher education institutions. Discussed at length are the challenges of financing that are characterized by declining public funding and the introduction of cost-sharing measures and other revenue diversification strategies. Developments in eight countries are analyzed for illustration. Uganda, Kenya, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, Egypt, Morocco, and Botswana. Further, the chapter looks at the changes in university governance and uh, leadership and management across the continent and within selected countries. This includes the roles and the responsibilities of governing boards or councils, vice chancellors and senior management, and the middle level academic managers from department chairs to school or college deans, and the implications of the administrative reforms on the quality and performance of higher education. Chapter three, America's troubles with affirmative action. The development and ch challenges facing higher education institutions in Africa since the turn of the 21st century are not unique. They are evident in other parts of the world, including the United States. In my book, The Transformation of Global Higher Education, 1945 to 2015, I identify five key, five key trends that are global in scope, although each is articulated in divergent regional and national particularities. They include massification, privatization, restructuring of knowledge systems, internationalization, and struggles for accountability and value. One aspect of the US Academy that has a special history concerns the overriding role that race plays in all aspects of American society, culture, economy, and politics. Higher education constitutes a crucial site in America's perpetual racial solitudes and struggles. In the opening story of my 1994 collection, The Joys of Exile, titled Waiting, I seek to capture this history of the last half millennium of the world system. The main character is a spirit child seeking to be born. Each time he or she selects a family somewhere in Africa, there is a historic tragedy that prevents his or her birth. The first father is captured and sold into slavery, joining the swelling, uh, swelling army of, quote, stolen people to build stolen lands, end of quote beyond the oceans. There, these are the two original scenes of the Americas, including the United States. I thought about this story when watching and reading the case about affirmative action uh, against Harvard University and the University of North Carolina before the Supreme Court, whose two-week hearing began on October 31, 2022. It was a poignant reminder that people of African descent are still waiting for justice from the enduring legacies of the systemic assaults of slavery, segregation, and white supremacy. The ideological and intellectual apparatus called higher education has been central in the struggles over historic redress and restitution distilled into what is called affirmative action. This is the su subject of the chapter. It examines the history of affirmative action, its twists and turns in the three branches of government, business, public opinion, and the educational system, with particular emphasis on colleges and universities. <coughs> it is divided into three parts. The first is titled, 
the still birth of affirmative action. It begins by tracing the origins of affirmative action from the executive orders of the Roosevelt administration in the 1930s to the civil rights legislation of the Johnson administration in the 1960s. It discusses desegregation uh, uh, in education, uh, in the education system following the 1954, uh, 1954 Supreme Court decision in the Brown versus Board of Education case. And a series of court cases as struggles for desegregation intensified in the 1950s and 60s uh, in, as some white universities uh, resisted integration and HBCUs sought equal funding and struggles for black studies intensified. Then it focuses on the legal challenges against affirmative action in higher education that gathered, gathered momentum from the late 1970s, an era when the, uh, when, uh, the post-war liberalism of uh, Roosevelt's New Deal and Johnson's Great Society gave way to the unfettered free market gospel of neoliberalism. The drive to strangle affirmative action in its infancy was encapsulated in the Powell Memorandum prepared by Lewis Powell in 1971, a year before he was appointed as Associate uh, Justice of the Supreme Court. Powell's controlling opinion in the, region, uh, in the re uh, regions of the University of California versus Bucky case allowed the consideration of race uh, as one of many factors to promote pedagogical diversity, but declared quotas to, uh, to, the right, uh, to, to right the historical wrongs of uh, discrimination as unconstitutional. The second part of the chapter analyzes the development of diversity discourse to weaken affirmative action in the aftermath of the Bakke case decision in 1978 that replaced the demands of the civil rights movement for restorative justice with the saccharine uh, discourse of diversity, which forestalled America's honest reckoning with the legacies of slavery and Jim Crow. The ways in which ethnic and racial minorities were increasingly pitted against each other in the affir uh, affirmative action debates, including the cynical deployment of the Asian model mi minority myth is considered. An argument is made that diversity discourse uh, sought to dilute the specificity of the African-American racialized experience, substituting it with an amorphous multiculturalism that sanctified cultural difference, real and imagined. Also examined are the various strategies that have been advanced to uh, uh, achieve diversity without race conscious admissions, such as jettisoning legacy preferences, preferences for faculty children, eliminating early admissions, boosting admissions of low income, first generation students, students who grew up in disadvantaged neighborhoods, and students with low family wealth. The jury is still out on the effectiveness of these measures. The third section scrutinizes the inherent institutional and intellectual obstacles that militate against affirmative action. It is pointed out that while the debate has largely focused on student admissions in the elite universities, the diversity of faculty, staff, and administrators across the board is equally critical. It is shown that despite wider wiggle room in this area, the record of most universities is disappointing. The chapter discusses surveys and studies that show high levels of disaffection and marginalization among black faculty and administrators who often find themselves having to prove their academic worth and suffer from various forms of microaggressions. Also examined in this context are the dynamics that sustain racialization in senior leadership appointments. Finally, the underlying epistemic structure that under undermines um, efforts to advance affirmative action uh, as an institutional and intellectual project uh, is analyzed. I look at Charles Mills's notion of white ignorance, a cognitive phenomenon of non-knowing, a debilitating blindness to black exper existence, experiences, and knowledges. Olufemo Taiwo extends Mills's idea, uh, ideas in his intriguing treatise on what he calls global racial empire and its implications for reparations and the position of African, of peoples of African descent in the Americas, in the American Academy, which I look into in detail. Chapter four, the challenges of the humanities. As a scholar, I have been a card carrying member of the humanities and social sciences since I went to university in 1972. 
When I became a high-ranking administrator as vice president for academic affairs at an American university and vice chancellor in, K uh, in Kenya overseeing colleges, schools, and fields outside my academic specialization and socialization, I placed my earlier intellectual affiliations in the broader context of the modern university in which the humanities are increasingly pushed to the bottom of the slippery higher education totem pole. Rather than despair about the humanities and social sciences, I've come to appreciate more keenly their indispensability, the powerful synergies between them and other branches of knowledge, the need to facilitate and foster interdisciplinary modes of knowledge production and consumption. In this chapter, I focus on the continued and critical importance of the humanities and social sciences in the post-COVID-19 academy. Before the outbreak of the pandemic, the uh, humanities, even more than the social sciences, were increasingly regarded in academic, political, and popular discourses in many parts of Africa and the United States as irrelevant affectations compared to the hard disciplines in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM. The pandemic seemed to reinforce these prejudices as the world desperately sought biomedical treatments in the race for vaccines and economic and social life, including education, transitioned to online platforms and virtual engagements, thereby accelerating the fourth industrial revolution. Yet, both the pandemic and digitalization underscored the, ne uh, the necessity of the knowledges, skills, and literacies of the humanities and social sciences. COVID-19 was not confined to a crisis of physical health. It also unleashed a mental health crisis and a complex constellation of economic, social, uh, cultural, and political crisis. Understanding the multidimensional nature and differentiated impact of the pandemic, devising effective containment strategies, and envisioning better futures required the insights, imaginations, and policies informed by the humanities and social sciences. Similarly, the transformations wrought by the fourth industrial revolution are as much technological as they are social. And the rapidly changing jobs of the digitalized economies of the 21st century require the cultivation of technical skills as much as lifelong learning skills that the humanities and social sciences are renowned for. Thus, the, there is need to develop more integrated and interdisciplinary modes of teaching and learning, research and scholarship, encompassing the humanities, social sciences, STEM, and other domains of the academic enterprise. The chapter is divided into three parts. First, it examines the discourse on the humanities in crisis, which goes back decades in the American Academy, as evident in the book by J.H. Plum titled Crisis in the Humanities, published in 1964. In this section, the works of some of the key protagonists in the debate during each decade from the 1960s to the, uh, to the present are examined in the context of the shifting institutional, intellectual, and ideological architecture of American higher education. The section concludes by examining the growing assault against the humanities in African countries and universities, often on misguided notions of their lack of utility for development, which is consigned to the exclusive domain of STEM, a way of thinking that is a product of the instrumentalization of the entrepreneurial or marketized university. When addressing ministers of finance, economic planning, and development at the annual conference of the United Nations Economic Commission by, uh, for Africa in May 2022, I was asked whether there should be penalties for humanity students and incentives for STEM students? You can guess my answer. <laughs> Second, the chapter focuses on the common critiques and defenses of the humanities. The defenders of the humanities come in many shades and colors, including what I call absolutists, functionalists, and pragmatists. I share the arguments I used to make as dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles and led as vice chancellors at USIU to suspicious parents, undecided students, dismissive faculty and administrators in the STEM and professional schools, and doubtful donors. I would point out that the liberal arts are priceless repositories of intrinsic, intellectual, instrumental, and idealistic knowledges, values, skills, and competencies. 
so essential for our turbulent, exceedingly complex, and rapidly changing societies and economies at multiple levels uh, or scales from the local to the global. Finally, the chapter suggests the ways interdisciplinarity can rescue the humanities from their purported crisis. As a student of intellectual history, the history of ideas and knowledge producing institutions, I believe we need to avoid freezing and flattening and homogenizing the humanities. Rather, we should see them as capacious and changing fields of intellectual inquiry, methods, practices, interests, literacies, and dispositions. It is this very porousness, expansiveness, and malleability that will, I propose, ensure the survival of the humanities in the academy and for society for the foreseeable future. I interrogate the conceptions and critiques of interdisciplinarity and the factors behind its rising popularity and the assorted nomenclature of multidisciplinarity, cross-disciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, some even talk of pluridisciplinarity, as well as the emergence of the so-called new, new humanities, such as the digital humanities, environmental humanities, energy humanities, global humanities, urban humanities, food humanities, medical humanities, legal humanities, and public humanities. Chapter five, the futures of education. At the turn of the 2020s, higher education found itself at a crossroads, unimaginable at the beginning of the century as it faced multiple crises, the disruptions of the COVID-19 pandemic, expansion with enduring disparities, changing funding models, technological disruptions, growing skepticism of the scientific process, rising complexity of accountability frameworks, and an even internationalization. There were also intensifying struggles over the epistemic scaffolding that has long sanctioned exclusions of vast segments of global knowledges, created imagined hierarchies of humanity, and rationalized histories of oppression, exploitation, and marginalization. This was occurring in a world no longer basking in the possibilities of globalization, democratization, and multilateralism, as it reeled from escalating hegemonic rivalries, competitive imperialisms, deepening social and economic inequalities, glaring developmental deficits, disruptive technologies and labor markets, alarming democratic recessions, intolerant populisms, political polarization, and persistent armed conflicts. The enduring fixations with economic growth, consumption, and avarice at the expense of nature led to rising threats of climate change and loss of biodiversity that cast an existential pall on an increasingly endangered planet. A new social contract is required for higher education as part of a new compact of human solidarity and ecological sustainability. Higher education must be seen as a global public good to advance ecological, intercultural, interdisciplinary, international, and information literacies, as well as collaborations and partnerships within and among institutions and countries across the global divides of North and South. It must embrace the human rights principles of social justice, solidarity, and respect for human life, uh, for life, human dignity, interconnectedness, um, and collective responsibility. It must uphold the values of free inquiry, critical thinking and creativity, academic freedom and shared governance, equity and pluralism, integrity and ethics, commitment to sustainability and social responsibility, and inclusive excellence through cooperation rather than competition. The chapter explores the futures of higher education in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. Pre-existing structural deficiencies and dysfunctions became cruelly evident while ongoing trends and innovations were accelerated. Higher education institutions embarked on and embraced changes that would have been unthinkable prior to the pandemic. Debate for the sector's future centers around the competing axes of restoration to the pre-pandemic past, reform based on lessons learned, or transformation to future profit. The chapter is divided into three parts. The first section re-examines the telos, 
of higher education and suggests the need to go beyond the conventional mission of universities for a more demanding and comprehensive value proposition. Discusses the dynamics of building institutional resilience, including creating sustainable financial models, reforming governance and structures, and recruiting and developing more effective leadership. Also investigated are the challenges unleashed by the pandemic for student and faculty well-being and the need for universities to develop the duty of care as a core part of their mission and institutional practices. In the second section, I assess the technological adaptations undertaken during the pandemic that seem destined to hasten changes in learning, research, and institutional operations. The debates about online education among academics, consultancy firms, and educational groups such as EDUCOS, the non-profit association that seeks to advance higher education through information technology are scrutinized. The imperatives for curricular transformation, the kind of learning frameworks that are needed to prepare students for the demands and opportunities of the post-pandemic 19 world and the rest of the 21st century are also investigated. Further, the critical challenges for education in an increasingly complex, interconnected, technological, volatile, uncertain, and rapid, rapidly changing world are identified. This calls for students uh, to be exposed to and master disciplinary, interdisciplinary, and procedural knowledges and the application of knowledge. Critical in constructing a new social contract for higher education is the creation of what I call uh, the global knowledge commons. I consider some of the major issues that are critical for the research agendas of the post-19 uh, COVID-19 academy. UNESCO has proposed open science as key to this agenda. It also requires rethinking internationalization, on which I present a 12-point agenda. The third section offers various scenarios for the future of higher education as proposed by individual scholars and institutions, including consultancy firms and national, regional, and international organizations. I briefly review the visions articulated by two organizations in the United States, representing the voices of faculty and university leaders, the Association of American University Professors and the Association of American Universities, respectively. This is followed by the scenarios drawn by the European Union Commission, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, the World Economic Forum, and UNESCO, all of which have undertaken undertaken massive surveys and projects on rethinking the futures of higher education. This underscores the fact that a lot of work is being conducted by various stakeholders of higher education at, a, at global, national, and institutional levels to design new futures. It is an endeavor African educators and universities must participate in and take seriously. Chapter six, the imperatives of lifelong learning. In their development, universities have always had to adapt to their times and prevailing conditions. In the 19th and 20th centuries, they responded to the needs of emerging national industrial economies. The predominant information and communication technologies of the time transformed higher education and facilitated the expansion of continuing education and lifelong learning as distances and time were compressed. Distance education expanded through the delivery of courses over snail mail, the telephone, radio, and television. At the turn of the 21st century, as the fourth industrial revolution accelerates, higher education uh, has come under intense pressure to serve the demands of increasingly globalized and digitalized knowledge economies. The new digital technologies have, be have been transforming educational institutions, a process that was accelerated by COVID-19. Continuing education comprises many strands, including adult education, professional and ex executive education, and what is increasingly called, referred to as lifelong learning across age groups uh, uh, for upskilling, reskilling, and personal enrichment. While continuing education and lifelong learning have repeatedly reinvented themselves to meet changing historical, economic, social, political, and cultural contexts, their enduring values remain a commitment to social inclusiveness, liberal learning, pragmatism, rigor and relevance, responsiveness to innovation and change, and inculcating the spirit and skills of flexibility, adaptability, agility, 
and resilience among learners. In the 21st century, continuing education and lifelong learning face new challenges and opportunities that I examine in this chapter. The chapter is divided into three parts. You can see I like three. Uh, first, it allows the debates on lifelong learning as the concept entered global discourse with the publication of UNESCO's pioneering report on the subject in 1972. I follow the evolution of this debate by examining a series of international studies and reports from the 1970s to the present on the changing conceptualization and content of lifelong learning, which supplanted the term continuing education. There was also a shift from humanistic to economistic rationales. Then a brief history of continuing education around the world is offered, beginning with adult education movements in the United States and the United Kingdom in the 19th century, with the establishment of the Lowell Institute at Harvard here in 1839 and the Institute of Continuing Education at Cambridge University in 1873. Second, the chapter examines the key forces behind the imperatives of lifelong learning. They include digital disruptions, demographic shifts, transformation of work, and rising pressures on higher education institutions for social impact, engagement, and accountability. Combined, the changes present almost unparalleled perils and possibilities for universities to universalize lifelong learning for 20, uh, 21st century knowledge economies and societies by building uh, adequate institutional capacities and commitments and pursuing strategic, smart, and systematic programmatic innovations, interventions, and initiatives. The analysis of each of these dynamics looks at the scholarly literature, academic magazines, and reports by some of the, uh, some of the leading consultancy firms such as McKinsey and Company and Deloitte, international organizations, including the World Economic Forum, International Labor Organization, OECD, and the increasingly uh, ubiquitous and largely unregulated online program providers. Third, the chapter offers a summary from a comprehensive survey I undertook of lifelong uh, programs at some of the world's leading universities, 15 in the United States, two each in Canada and Australia, and seven each in Asia and Europe. Altogether, 10 types of crop programs are offered, and the modes of delivery encompass, of course, face-to-face, -face, online, or, and blended or hybrid. This is followed by a review of the current state of lifelong programs lifelong learning programs in the United States and in Africa. In the case of the US, I discussed the situation in 2022 in terms of the main reasons universities are increasingly embracing lifelong learning, their primary audiences, the impact of COVID-19, and their greatest challenges. For African countries, I show lifelong learning was adopted for many of the same economic, demographic, political, and social reasons as elsewhere, but with an accent on its possibilities as an engine for educational transformation for sustainable development. The chapter examines general trends across the continent and in specific countries and priority areas, such as adult education and literacy, and the recent introduction of competency-based education, CBE. The transformative potential of CBE remains to be seen, as it is still largely new. For example, in Kenya, it was only introduced in 2019. Please allow me one indulgence as I conclude my remarks. In the acknowledgement, I mention numerous individuals, universities, and organizations that I've engaged with since the outbreak of the pandemic, without who, whom uh, this book would not have been written. Some are in the audience here physically. Others, I'm looking at them. <laughs> Others are online. I would like to single one uh, out one individual here by reading the conclusion of the acknowledgement. Lastly, but always first in my scale of personal and professional indebtedness is my life partner, Cassandra Rachel Vini. I relish her fatal mind and is the first to read anything I write and vice versa. She witnessed the genesis and development of this book with her endearing patience and unconditional support and ensured through her customary incisive reading and critique that it is far better than it would have been without her incisive interventions. Thank you. <laughs>
alimony payments for him, boy. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. 47% illiteracy and or 49% illiteracy, mm -hmm. adult illiteracy in right. uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or all of Africa? Um, all of Africa. Uh, you, the, the way data is produced on Africa depends who is producing it. So for the Economic Com Commission for Africa. You mean whether they're literate or not? <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Whether they're literate about Africa. But, but it's, it's usually uh, the ECA and the AU produces data on the whole continent. The international financial institutions, the World Bank and so on, produces data on Sub-Saharan and North Africa, which is a homage to the Hegelian construct of Africa. Uh, which, anyway, yeah. So that one is for the whole Africa. But what could be done about that? I mean, that's, yeah. I, I, I couldn't focus, I mean, I loved your talk, but I just kept th thinking about, for goodness yeah, sake, yeah, yeah. how do so you explain that? Well, you, you can explain. And we can't talk about, don't, don't talk about white people. In no, 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 no. Yeah, you, 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 you can explain it by many. Uh, first of all, the book goes into a lot of detail <laughs> explaining right. that. But, I, you know, there are all sorts of forces. There are, you know, policy issues. There are institutional issues. And there are ways in which these, uh, these institutions are being run. So during the 1980s, when, you know, this gospel of, um, you know, sort of neoliberal uh, interventions uh, came in to focus on primary. A lot of governments invested, you know, they invested in primary education and divested from higher education. And you saw those numbers, while they may be horrific in terms of what, where they stand in 2020, they were even worse, obviously, uh, before that. Mm. So there's been progress in terms of enrollment, literacy rates, and so on. However, the deficit is obviously huge. And part of it in the book, I, sh I give a lot of statistics on um, expenditures on education. Many African countries at independence used to spend a, in a huge chunk of their budgets on education. This expenditure was stopped, quote unquote, or reduced because of structural adjustment programs, which said that the state has no role to play in the social sector. You have to deregulate the economy. You have to privatize everything. And what, when you, you, know, uh, you begin to see this very sharp decline in investment in uh, tertiary education, as well as, of course, overall in the other educational sectors. So just to give you, you know, one, one figure which is fascinating. Uh, expenditures per student in 1980 across Africa, uh, this is an average, was $6,800. By 2020, it was $981. You see a huge drop. And many countries used to spend up to 6% of GDP. And so, you know, in terms of their budgets, up to 25, you know, sometimes even 30%. And you see a sharp drop in that. So this is a result of many forces. A lot of them are internal forces, but a lot of them are global forces. Because neoliberalism was not an ideology that just impacted on Africa. Neoliberalism impact on the United States as well. You know, to take uh, the example which I show again in the book, uh, expenditures in the U.S. on education from the 1960s uh, to the present, you find that state subventions have reduced dramatically. So, uh, uh, you know, University of Illinois, where I spent uh, the longest part of uh, uh, my life, uh, you know, in the 1960s, the state used to, you know, 1965-66 uh, uh, provide about 50 percent of funding for University of Illinois. By last year, it's less than 10%. So this process of you know, I, I underfunding uh, is a global process. But when you are a poorer country and a poorer institution, the effects are even worse. So this is part of global capitalist restructuring. So you can't say A is responsible, B is not responsible. It's a very entangled web. Uh, which, yeah. but, but, but structural adjustment didn't say that the state should remove itself from primary education. That can't no, be. No, uh, uh, what he said was that the state, A, should reduce expenditures on social sectors Privat uh, and privatize the social sector. So reduce... But not privatize schools. No, that too. And a lot of schools were privatized or new schools were established as private institutions. So there is that general ideology of reducing expenditures on social sectors, on public uh, uh, sector. 
And then secondly, within the educational sector, there is going to be the reduction of the expenditures on tertiary education, saying you don't need universities. In fact, people like me, my brother there, Emmanuel, are products of that migration from Africa with the devastation of universities. Now, what that means, and this ties to the second figure that I mentioned in that uh, 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 place, is that if the universities are being devastated, the production of teachers for the lower levels of education is going to be affected. And you're going to increasingly produce people who are not well educated. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, people may finish, you know, uh, from four, as they call it, you know, high school. But their, you know, reading levels and, and other, you know, scientific thinking and all that kind of stuff may be much lower than they ought to. Partly because, obviously, the uh, production of, um, p you know, teachers, which really is part of the tertiary sector to do. Uh, and the tertiary sector is being decimated. So this has a ripple effects, even if expansion of the primary sector uh, is, 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 is uh, taking place. Now, it doesn't mean that the, you know, the higher education sector stopped growing, as I mentioned in the 19, um, 1980s and 1990s. In fact, you know, I give data for every country on the continent. How many universities were established up to 1999? And how many have been established since 2000? Uh, so the expansion continued, but the quality, and I go into a lot of detail about the quality of that education. So the student-faculty ratios in many of your universities really move from what, you know, when I went to school uh, in the early 70s, uh, our average class was about 12, 15 kids. It was a very intense experience. Now, the average class in many universities is one to 100, sometimes more. And I give data for different countries on that. So what you're doing is you are expanding, but at the same time, issues of quality become increasingly uh, important uh, in terms of the products. And you find this expresses itself in all sorts of ways. One is the mismatch between the college graduates and the labor market, what they call in Kenya, tarmacy. So a lot of students who graduate tarmac. In other words, they are looking for job forever. And the levels of you know, you know, that mismatch is such that, for example, in Egypt, um, you're better off being a, a, a high school graduate than a college graduate mm -hmm. in terms of getting jobs. So there is that huge mismatch, which again, so it's not just the numbers, but it's also the quality. So the prospects for changing <coughs> what I think of as the curve of class throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, by which I mean diminishing people, the percentage of people living in poverty, and increasing the percentage of people in the working slash middle class mm -hmm. are, or what, Professor? They are getting worse. Inequalities are getting worse. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, studies by the World Bank show that while inequality around the world, you know, sort of the gap uh, is reducing in many places, particularly Asia. Asia is a very dramatic story. Uh, in Africa, they're increasing. Um, and what you're getting in terms of universities, a lot of us in my generation, I, I'm looking at Emmanuel, I don't know whether that's true for you, uh, is that a lot of us were from you know, working class, some peasant backgrounds. But now we are sufficiently sizable, we are reproducing ourselves. So it's, it's class reproduction. And- um, It's called legacy. Or yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there, there are all these, you know, all these class dynamics and so on and so forth which are part of, and that's why I said, in terms of structural adjustment, you know, people talk about, you know, the World Bank imposed, the IMF imposed, that's true up to a certain point. But the African elites were part of that calculation. It was in their interests. So finally, what are the prospects for? Every time I landed, I, I mentioned this. Sorry, I mentioned this uh, in this very room. Every time I land in uh, uh, Lagos or in um, Accra, or in Joburg, or in Cape Town. Um, I just, you know, miles and miles and miles of people living in, in, in poverty, and you just wonder, and then you go to your friends who are in the definite 1%. I don't even know if it's 1%. It's like a percentage <laughs> of 1%. And then you think, how long, Lord, how long? Um, how long? Well, uh, if we're living long enough, eventually, uh, but more seriously, 
I think what is happening across Africa, and, and, and it's very difficult to generalize in some cases, but what is happening is that class formations are definitely congealing. The middle yeah, class, definitely what? congealing, you know, congealing. yeah. Uh, what do you have? The middle classes are expanding. There's no question about that. Uh, there's been massive expansion of the middle classes over the last two decades. Um, and you can see that in all sorts of indicators, which, which I discuss again in the book. At the same time, the elite, you know, your 1%, they are there, uh, is also growing very rapidly. In fact, the, gro uh, the fastest gr uh, growth in terms of billionaires it, it, relative to, you know, um, where they're coming from is in Africa. Uh, in 2020, there, there were about 200,000 Africans that were high net, within, uh, high net worth individuals with net assets of more than a million. And then, of course, you have the hyper with more than 30 million. Uh, collectively, they, they have wealth of $2 trillion. So that class is growing very rapidly. The middle class is also growing. What you are seeing is the squeezing of the working class because of the changes in the economy. Uh, in which the manufacturing was devastated by structural adjustment and later on by the rise of China and, and uh, the divestment uh, from, uh, from that sector uh, by African capital. So the, the working class is really finding a lot of challenges. The peasantry is under enormous pressure, uh, partly because of certain agrarian policies, but also the effects of climate change. Again. What you find in, you know, when you look at, and I give some data here, the global map of climate change, you know, uh, since 1750, uh, Africa has contributed less than uh, about 1% uh, to global climate issues, and yet is the most vulnerable in the world today because of, you know, all sorts of dynamics. So what you are seeing, in other words, is a very complex picture of class development, class formation, different sectors of the economy, growing at different rates, you f the biggest sector now in African economies is the service sector. Manufacturing has actually declined in 20, in 2000, uh, 1990, uh, sorry. Uh, manufacturing contributed at least 20% to some African economies. By 2015, it was down to 10%, and for some countries, less than 7%. So there's been deindustrialization, which is premature, because it, it hadn't reached the level uh, of industrialization. You know, the U.S. has is, is been undergoing deindustrialization as well as we know, but it's a different story. Although, even in the case of the United States, you find the effects of that deindustrialization and increasing poverty in certain pockets of this country, leading to all sorts of social, political challenges that we are seeing today. So these dynamics are very, yeah. Corruption, graft, dash. That's my final question. I have to leave early to be filmed, but I couldn't. What is the, the role of corruption? It's a, it's, yeah, it's, it's a big role. The corruption takes place at multiple levels, obviously. There is the traffic policeman who stops you uh, for chai, tea. Uh, and uh, they're stopping you because they're underpaid. I'm not justifying it. They're, they're concrete reasons. Then, of course, the most important corruption that really destroys these societies is elite corruption. And that elite corruption is in connivance with Western elites, Western institutions. That money is not kept in Kenyan banks. It's kept in Swiss banks. Uh, Tapo Mbeki, the president, former president of South Africa, was commissioned to do a study with a number of other Af prominent Africans on the repatriation of wealth uh, from Africa. It's massive. And all these discoveries, the Panama you know, Canal papers, the Erie papers, and what have you, show a, you know, a lot of uh, the elites really keep their money out of the, uh, out of the continent. Uh, and a lot of companies in Africa, involved, you know, who operate in Africa, are part of that corrupt uh, uh, network. Harry Burton, you know, um, the, the company, uh, yeah, um, was sued for bribing. Nigerian politicians several years ago. They, they spent about 30 million you know, giving handshakes. So this is a complex web. Did they lose? Yeah, they lost the case. And then I wonder who took that money. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Sorry, on that note, I gotta go. Yeah, okay. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>
Great job, my brother, Professor Paul. Um, <laughs> chapter four, the, uh, the challenges of the humanities. You mentioned uh, three groups. You mentioned uh, uh, absolutists, fundamentalists, and what was that third group? Um, pragmatists. Pragmatists. And when it, when it has to do with the challenges of the humanities, could you like, like define like what each of those groups you know means or yeah. represents? Yeah. So your absolutists, you know, basically make an argument. You don't know the humanities are important. Of course, they're important. You know, and we are the ones who ha who possess truth about the world. The rest of you are you know, wasting your time. You need to immerse yourself in the humanities. So it's a very absolutist argument that in which there is um, is based on a sense that is self evident. In fact, th th this morning there is a very interesting article in the New York Times by um, Dauhat, you know, the conservative columnist on, on the humanities, the trouble with the humanities. I don't know if you read it. Yeah. So it's, it's that argument that is self-evident. So the pragmatists usually make arguments that we are useful to. Mm -hmm. So they will produce data on how you know our graduates you know, uh, make um, very good employees because they have critical thinking, mm -hmm. communication skills, interpersonal skills, intercultural skills, you name it, writing skills, and so on. And, and you know, so the, the humanities is depicted as additive, mm -hmm. as an add-on. Mm -hmm. the, the, for me, the humanities, you know, first of all, we say humanities for, no, for a reason. It's a, there is multiplicity within that. And that's why I, you know, uh, in, in the book I spend a lot of time uh, saying we should not flatten them, collapse them, homogenize them into one thing. And the humanities themselves have been evolving. Now, there is a, an issue with certain branches of the humanities. Because the humanities range from history, <laughs> where my brother Emmanuel and I sort of come from, to literary studies, English, classics, anthropology, you name it. Now, each of these disciplines have different histories in the ways they have constructed knowledges on Africa. So you find there is a lot of antagonism, for example, in the African Academy. Uh, it's kind of you know, you know, died down a little bit um, <coughs> against anthropology because of the construction of the other was the foundational basis of you know, certain branches of anthropology. Of course, anthropology has different uh, you know, areas. And that other was always on, on a scale of humanity, w whatever you're looking at, less than, whether you're talking about culture, practices, religious practices, sexuality, whatever it is you're talking about, it's on a lower register. Now. Uh, and, and, and the you know, ethnographic method with its you know, sort of always the present tense, you know, the functionalist um, anthropology of the 1930s, 1920s, 30s, and so on, uh, froze these societies and created this notion of traditional Africa, which we historians really you know, bristle tradition at one point in time. And that froze these communities, and ironically, some African nationalists and intellectuals actually use those kinds of templates to construct images of what indigenous Africa is. Uh, Terence Ranger and Eric Hopo have a very interesting book called uh, Invention of Tradition. They show how the creation of a lot of traditions we assume to be customary, for example, customary law. Customary law was really um, uh, a product of a very intentional project between the colonial government and men. Because the ones they interviewed were men. The British are coming with their own Victorian patriarchal you know, uh, ideology. And then the men in some of these societies are like, oh, it's time to rearrange the gender order. So you're asking, how did women behave in our society? They were always submissive. They were always under our thumb. Okay, customary law. The woman has no right to property. 
cannot access loans without my signature. This is in Ghana, in Malawi. These were, some of them were matrilineal society. The man was irrelevant <laughs> in terms of property. But you freeze that and impose an ideology that only, not only emanates from, you know, you know, England was not a gender sensitive society at the colonial era, you know. And then you're talking to men in African societies who are also interested in imposing a certain ideology. Particularly as it is tied to economic processes of migrant labor, in which men are leaving the village to go work on farms, on the mines, and so on. And the gender order in the local area is being destabilized. And we want to reimpose a certain order. So a simple thing like customary law, it's not simple, but one area called customary law, you can actually trace its construction as a combination of multiple ideologies and practices that serve the interest of the colonizer and the interest, in this particular case, of men in that society. Mm. Thanks. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, while you were speaking, I was struck by how often what you were saying about the continent applied to us here, applied to the Caribbean, and so uh, when, you were, when you were responding to Skip, everything you said to me applied to what we're dealing with. So, but, so my question is, when we're thinking about revisioning the, the, the academies, to what extent do you think um, students, in, students across the African continent during Roads Must Fall, for example, to what extent do you think their, um, their positions during those, um, during, at, at those moments um, have shaped how you and others are thinking about mm -hmm. what, what should happen? Yeah, thank you, that's a really good uh, question. It, it has shaped people like me tremendously uh, because what, what the, student, uh, the, the students' movement in South Africa, and, and of course, you know, there are similar movements of different magnitude uh, with different accents. Uh, across the continent. And my generation was involved in those <laughs> movements, by the way, in our own time. We, we, we are constantly challenging not only the epistemic order in which we were uh, being, you know, sort of uh, socialized into, uh, but also the institutional organization, you know, the, the, the administration and so on and so forth. Now, the, the Fist Must Fall movement, the forest movement, as uh, Banashe calls it, um, really challenged the citadels of the neoliberal restructuring of South Africa, um, which raised questions about access to universities. South Africa has the most expensive, even today, and, and I have data here to show, uh, has the most expensive educational system on the African continent. And, and if you use uh, purchasing power parity, conversions, and, and uh, you know, income levels and all that kind of stuff, in the world. So what the students were reacting to was what previous generations of African students across the continent had reacted to, namely decolonization of the curriculum. We fought in my generation, mind you, you know, some of us are old, I uh, went to university seven years after the country got independent. And immediately we said, why are you giving us this, you know, we challenged our professors, why are you giving us all these texts? from Europe and America, where the text by African thinkers, and it's the same question the forests were asking. So the decolonization agenda has been one of the con constant themes in African letters, in African education. The second thing they were asking, which for us was not an issue, was accessibility to higher education. Now, when I went to school, it was free. So you never paid a penny. In fact, we were paid. You know, every month we got to what, you know, in Kenya they call it boom. They used to call it boom. You got a boom, you know. In our case, uh, you know, we got, you know. And some people would use that money to support, you know, relatives and so on and so forth. That shifted from the 1980s with cost-sharing uh, cost measures in which the cost of education was transferred from the state and the institutions to the individual which means their parents, their families, their sponsors, and so on. And what that meant 
is that this class segmentation that uh, you know, Skip was uh, talking about begins really to coalesce. And you find that uh, it's the kids uh, who are already well-to-do who end up going to invest. But ironically, this is quite interesting, ironically, these are the ones leading protests against tuition. Many of them can afford it. In fact, many of them have gone to very expensive private schools that are more expensive than the university. But the ideology of the state supporting higher education is so deeply entrenched that this took place. In the case of South Africa, what you find, there is the racial dynamic that brings in these issues. But there is also an issue of class. There is a group of you know, um, black South Africans who are you know, sort of the missing middle. They are not rich enough to afford higher education and therefore they do not receive state subsidy and they cannot pay themselves. So if you look at the, you know, sort of the dynamics of this movement, it's raising the question of accessibility in addition to decolonization. And it's also raising a third question, governments. Many African universities, like American universities, are very authoritarian institutions, structurally. You know, uh, power, <laughs> pronouncement, follow, or your tenure, yeah? And all of us are socialized to become obedient. You're, we are disciplined to become obedient members of our institutions because the cost of not being obedient is very high. Now the students, just like the 1968 movement, student revolt in, in Europe and, and, and the Americas, which led actually to, you know, I'll talk about it, uh, to the development of lifelong learning as, 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 as a sort of an ideology and as a practice. The, stu the, 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 the students really are not wedded to your structures. F first of all, they're gonna be there for a few years. And so they really don't care. They just want to make sure that services are being provided properly and so on. And, 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 and therefore, the struggle for the democratization of governance was a key part of the forest movement, which is a key part of African student protest movement. If you look at the you know, um, uh, democratization that began to take place from the uh, turn of the 1980s and 1990s, 2000s and so on, uh, across Africa, some of the main bastions of those protests were the university campuses. And that's why when the World Bank and IMF said, you know, you don't need universities, the African leaders were like, I think you're right. <laughs> because they were bastions of resistance. So the forest movement has its own uh, you know, particularities, but it also has resonance across the continent. Africa and you know, between the US and different African countries is, is very, very bracing uh, and insightful. I, I have a question and I'm mindful that for very obvious reasons you're focusing on, on futures and you're warning us about just taking tranches frozen in the past, mm -hmm. but I'm interested in nostalgia uh, <laughs> as a danger in thinking about higher education in mm -hmm. Africa. Mm -hmm. With all that said, though, are there examples, experiments from higher education in Africa in the past that you think we can still draw important cues and inspiration mm -hmm. from? Mm -hmm. You know, I think so often growing up of hearing constantly about Makerere in the yes. late 1960s, early 70s as a triangular university based in Uganda, but for Kenya mm -hmm. and Tanzania mm -hmm. as well. All the dreams people have and all the nostalgia yes. people have. Yes. I mean, are, are there any past experiments that you thought, you know, we actually mm -hmm. should, shouldn't let go of that? Yes, um, th thank you for that. Again, a very wonderful question. Yes, there are a lot of examples. In fact, what I do is, in the 12 countries that I examine in uh, one of the chapters, in terms of their histories of education, you know, Uganda is one of them, and Makarele and so on. In the 1960s and 1970s, they, they, they really made huge advances intellectually, in terms of knowledges that were being produced, uh, the training of the students, the engagement between higher education, state, and society, those, those you know. Um, and, and some of the models that were being established 
interestingly enough, when you read the works of so the, the nationalists, so in, in, the, in the book I look at the thought of Kwame Nkrumah, for example, at length. Uh, he, he gave a brilliant, brilliant uh, address at the opening of the African Studies Institute at the University of Ghana in 1962. And you read that, and you say to yourself, none of us has actually transcended what Nkrumah said in 1962. And you read Nyerere's address at the opening of the University of Dar es Salaam, his complicated understanding of the role of the post-colonial university as both an engine of Africa's development, uh, you know, intellectually and in terms of human capital development and so on, but also as Africa's window to integration in the world. So, you know, the, 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 you know I'm, I'm just absolutely amazed when, when I read that kind of stuff. And, and you also find, uh, reading the works of many African university leaders in the 60s and 1970s, and the kinds of reforms, institutional reforms they were bringing to decolonize the university were absolutely amazing. The tragedy, frankly, is that that process, almost organic transformation, was really brought to an ab abrupt halt with structural adjustment. And then you establish a new paradigm uh, in which uh, you know the, the forests and others, uh, people, the younger scholars, academics, and so on, have had to battle once again. Instead of building uh, on the traditions, the great traditions of your Makarele, of your Ibadan, of your Khartoum, of, of and so on and so forth, you, you, you almost you know forced to go back to square one. Not quite, you know, you never really go back, but but you know you revisit some of those debates. Uh, and, and uh, struggles that should have been carried forward uh, in terms of uh, governance, in terms of intellectual production. Uh, you have universities that don't have a you know, research budget. In those days, there was money for research, serious money. And the production of, of academics from those institutions was comparable to anybody in the world. That's no longer true. Africa today spends 0.59% of its GDP on R&D, research and development. The average for the world is 1.79%. That already tells you the story. So the entire continent is producing 3.5% of global public scientific publication. Look at that. Asia is the world leader. It's more than 12%. Thank you so much, Prof. I really appreciate it. Um, this presentation and your commitment just over the years of your scholarship um, to asking the not so nice questions and also throwing the Molotov cocktails. You've been a great example for many of us. Um, one of the things that was really interesting, one, just to affirm that yes, I mean, when I hear my parents' experiences of being at UZ and then I went to Wits University, it was a very different kind of idea of being able to level for them as people of a so-called peasant grand, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, background and the ways in which it fundamentally transformed a whole generation. It was simply not available to our generation, mm -hmm. and that's part of the discontent that you have at WITS, which is the seat of Fees Must Fall because of that missing middle mm -hmm. of a majority mm -hmm. black working class university mm -hmm. and the discontents um, of that. What I find really interesting has been a kind of almost reversal in that moment, I mean, as we speak right now at Wits University and seeing that kind of feudalism and this clamping down um, mm -hmm. of the securitization of campuses, uh, many mm -hmm. of those running mm -hmm. battles between, you know, um, milit militarized campuses and that kind of thing happening um, um, on campuses is quite interesting to then see how many of those who are so authoritarian and even calling students Boko Haram are therefore then called yeah. on to be the experts on decolonization mm -hmm. and really sort of marginalizing that student voice or that perspective on, so there's the appropriation of fallism for something mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. um, and almost reversal of the gains of, of, of that movement. And it's been interesting to see many of the reflections by vice chancellors, mm -hmm. by, you mm -hmm. know, that completely, work to completely delegitimize mm -hmm. what was mm -hmm. happening and mm -hmm. to almost then um, <coughs> put in uh, a lot of very regressive measures as we're seeing right now playing out on campuses. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what your senses of that because I think there's a disconnect between some of you who are more 
progressive than some of your peers who are a little bit more um, authoritarian, but then can then appropriate and look like you know the champions of decolonization? Yeah, I, I think you raise a very profound question. Um, and one actually needs to do a sociology of African academic leaders. Many of us drink the Kool-Aid. Um, and we implement the kinds of measures that in our earlier years we would have denounced, but it become very comfortable at a purely sort of banal level. But there is also a dynamic that um, I think is critical. And, and that dynamic is the audience that you are writing for, or you are enunciating your political position for. And there is a way in which the currency is not the students. The currency is your, at best, compatriots, at worst, your comprador, people listening to you from the global north. And you are translating very complicated situations in a language, to your point, that delegitimizes, delegitimizes in a language that makes sense to them. So if you talk of Boko Haram, the antenna is up. This is a terrorist organization. So you know, there is no subtlety to using terminologies like that. To what is, it, I said, you know, this is stupid, sorry, uh, <laughs> to call it that. Um, so, but, but if you, you are gesturing to a, a, an audience that is not the one you should be speaking to, you're gonna use that, uh, that language. Um, and, and what, I, you know, this is you know, sort of connected but not directly. What I find fascinating, you know, when I read a lot of African intellectual work, particularly the very radical uh, scholarship, you know, the ones who say, you know, decolonize, let's do this. Of course, I agree with them at, at a certain ideological level. But what I find interesting is that then every theoretical text they are using is from the global north. They are not immersed in African thought at all. They, they can't tell you what uh, Sheikh Anta Diop, or you know, what uh, Edward Blyden in the 19th century was writing, what Du Bois was writing, you know. They, they can't tell you that. They'll tell you what Foucault said, <laughs> and Derrida, <laughs> and all these great masters. Of you know, I have nothing against Foucault, or Derrida. I, you know, I read them, but is that separation between theory as something that you import and the raw material, the descriptive empirical work? So you are always battling with fitting your raw material into the theoretical formation. And half the time is not the theory that you find problematic. You know, you and I had a conversation last week. What you find problematic is your reality. <laughs> and the moment you do that, you cannot understand where you are. And one final question. Uh, first, uh, Thank you. My mind is just so full of all these facts that you shared with us. I uh, uh, thank you. It, it's just um, I will look at education in Africa very differently now. I my with my eyes wide open. I had a couple of questions about uh, some of the other things that might have played into the situation as it is. I, so for example, uh, the, the different ethnic mi minorities that we hear uh, battling each other, are, is, are these ethnic issues, do they uh, play into who the haves and the have-nots in Africa? And also, <coughs> what about the, re re well, relig different religions, I'm thinking, Islam and friends and female friends in Sudan who can't go with me 
to visit something unless their husbands give them permission. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know uh, you, from Sudanese prehistory <laughs> that it was a matrilineal civilization. And I'm just continuing. Um, I'm just throwing things out at you because they're just coming out here. Uh, oh, why did you choose the countries that you chose? Is it because the data was available? or uh, and, and, and finally, where is your optimism? What are you... Oh. Uh, <laughs> positive about yeah, you I'm a, an eternal optimist uh, in the sense that I do believe fundamentally uh, that people have an agency to recreate the world and and I see a lot of that across across the continent in all sorts of you know pockets and so on and so forth uh, for example the chapter on uh, humanities I spent a lot of time talking about the creative industries the creative economy I mean the way music and 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 dance and theater and fashion has, has just blossomed in that continent. And I'm saying universities need to incorporate that into the, when they're talking about the humanities, you know, history is great, of course we have to be there. But also, you know, understand what's going on in your society right now. So I'm very op op optimistic, but mine is not, you know, there, there are three types of um, ways of being opt uh, of, of uh, looking at any country or society or community or continent. One is to be, <laughs> which we're all familiar with, Afro-pessimist. You know, Africa is doomed. That's nonsense. You know, Africa is not doomed. You know, we'll be there for, in fact, we're going to be <laughs> uh, there for as long as this planet is ar around. So Africa is not doomed. Um, Africa has made huge advances since decolonization. But precisely because some of us expect and believe it is capable of doing more, we want more. The second is to be an Afro-optimist, and brindled, you know, it's, everything is great, you know, blah, blah. I like to think of myself and maybe my brother there as an Afro-realist, who in the, in the liberation struggles in Southern Africa, there used to be, you know, sort of a philosophy as it were, of saying you have to understand with cold, your cold eyes, the situation as it is to fight it. Don't put on those, you know, big blinkers. And you have to have the belief that you can change it. The so-called uh, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. And the when it comes to so you know I'm I'm very open. When it comes to African issues and conflicts and so on, I know there are experts sitting here. The, the challenge when looking at African issues is always a shorthand, which is embedded in the academy you know, and popular you know, media. So when there is a conflict, I'll give you an example. When there is a conflict in Britain you know, between the Irish and uh, uh, the English, they'll call it uh, a nationalist conflict. When there is a conflict in Asia, they'll call it communal. When there is a conflict in Africa, they'll call it tribal. That's a scale of human organization. And it's already making judgments. So they would, you know, all you have to do when you see a conflict in Africa is to say, oh yeah, of course it's tribalism. That obviates any need for explanation. You have signaled to your audience. Well, of course, what do you expect? Tri tri tribal people fight all the time. So you don't have to explain anything. So what I always tell people is that conflicts in Africa are not different from conflicts elsewhere. Of course, there are different components in, in which they, you know, they, 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 they congeal in a particular space and at a particular time. But these are about economic issues. These are about social issues. These are about um, even development, about the distribution of be the national cake, of benefit, of, of, of rights and responsibilities of democracy. There are all those issues. And, and I always tell my students, don't use the word tribe in my class. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. But it, because it doesn't explain anything. Analyze the actual conflict. It could be because you know, the, you know, people are struggling over you know, diminishing land resources because of climate change and water and you know, uh, pasture for animals, all those dynamics. There are ways we can explain this. And 
One is simply to say African societies are human societies and therefore amenable to human explanation as to why it's great.